Hey everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm. My name is Without Boats, as in yeah, Sin Botes. Um, you can. Most people call me Boats, which is actually even more confusing. Um, I am a researcher at Mozilla. I uh, work on Rust. It's my full-time job. It's pretty cool. Uh, I think. Um, so this talk is going to be about sort of it's a feature that I've been working on for uh, about the last year and a half, and before me, other people were working on for. Uh, uh, it's, I mean, honestly, since before the very beginning of Rust, before 1.0. Um, but before that, I just wanted to uh, thank the organizers for having me and for all of their work in putting this conference on. Um, I think I maybe someone's already said pointed this out, but. Uh, I believe this is the first uh, Rust conference outside of either the United States or Europe, and so as someone who works on Rust, I'm really like excited and glad to see our global community like thriving and growing, and it's really cool to see all the conferences that are happening this year. Um, on to the technical stuff. So uh, the feature that I've been working on is this thing called async await. Um, it's sort of going to be probably the, the biggest thing that we do in the language this year. We're planning to ship it sometime in the next few months. Uh, and it's the solution to this problem that we've been struggling with for a really long time, which is how can we have a uh, zero cost abstraction for uh, asynchronous I.O. in Rust? So uh, I'm going to explain what zero cost abstraction means in a moment, but first just to kind of give an overview of the feature. So. Um, async await, it's just these two new keywords that we're adding to the language, uh, async and await. And so um, uh, async is this modifier that can be applied to like functions um, where now the function instead of when you call it, it runs all the way through and returns, instead it returns immediately and it returns this future that will eventually result in whatever the function would return. And inside of uh, an async function, you can take the await operator and apply it to other features which will pause the function until those features are ready. And so it's this way of handling asynchronous concurrent operations using these annotations that makes them uh, much easier to write. So here's just a little code sample just to uh, sort of highlight and explain the feature. Um, this is in like basically just a, an adapter on like a, like a kind of ORM type of thing. Uh, it's handwritten, uh, where you have this uh, get user method which takes a string for a username and then returns this like user domain object by querying the database for the record for that user. Uh, and it does that using async IO, which means that it's an async function instead of just a normal function. And so when you call it, you can await it. And then just to walk through the, the body of this, of this method, you just, the first thing is it creates this SQL query. Um, interpolating the username into, you know, the select from users table. Uh, and then we query the database. And this is where we're actually performing some I.O. So query also returns a future because it's doing this async I.O. And so when you query the database, you just add this await in order to wait for the response. And then once you get the response, you can parse a user out of it. Uh, this user domain object, which is, you know, part of your application. And so this method is just sort of like a toy example for the talk, but what I wanted to highlight in it is the, that the only difference really between this and using blocking I.O. are these little annotations where you just mark the functions as being async and when you call them you add this await. And so it's, you know, relatively little overhead for getting, uh, using non-blocking I.O. instead of blocking I.O. Uh, and in particular in Rust, uh, the really great thing about our implementation that makes me really excited about it is that uh, our uh, async await and futures are this zero cost abstraction. And so, <coughs> um, uh, zero cost abstractions are sort of a really defining feature of Rust. It's one of the things that differentiates us from a lot of other languages is that we uh, really care about uh, when we add new features that they are zero cost. We didn't actually come up with the idea. Uh, it's a big thing in C++ also, and so I think the best explanation is this quote from Bjarne Strustrup, which is that a zero cost abstraction means that when you don't use it, you don't pay for it, and further, when you do use it, you couldn't hand code it any better. And so 
there's these two aspects to a zero cost abstraction, which is that the first is that uh, the feature can't affect, can't add costs to people who aren't using the feature. So we can't add this global cost that will slow down every program in order to enable, the, in order to enable this feature. Um, and then the second is that uh, when you do use the feature, it can't be s slower than if you didn't use it and then you feel like, oh, well, I would like to use this really nice feature that makes it easier, but it will make my program slow and so I'll just like, write this thing by hand that will be a much bigger pain. And so I'm going to kind of walk through the history of how we've tried to solve async I.O. in Rust and some of the steps along the way we hit, uh, had features that failed the zero cost test on both, both principles. So the specific problem that we're trying to solve is async I.O. Um, and so uh, normally I.O. is blocking, so when you use I.O. you'll block the thread and that will stop your program and then have to be rescheduled by the OS. Uh, and the problem with blocking I.O. is it just doesn't really scale when you have, you're trying to serve a lot of connections from the same program. And so for these kinds of really high scale network services, uh, you really need some form of non-blocking or asynchronous I.O. And uh, Rust in particular is supposed to be designed for languages that have these really high performance requirements. You know, it's a systems programming language for people who uh, really care about the computing resources they're using. And so for Rust to really be successful in the network space, we really need some sort of solution to this asynchronous I.O. problem. Uh, but the, the big problem with async I.O. is that uh, the way it works is that when you call the I.O. You know, system call, it just returns immediately and then eventually you can continue doing other work. But it's your program's responsibility for figuring out how to um, like schedule going back to the task that you, were, you had to pause on when you are doing the asynchronous I.O. And so this makes you know, writing an async I.O. program much more complex than writing one that uses blocking I.O. And so a lot of languages that are trying to target these like scalable network services have been trying to come up with solutions for this problem that like take it, make it not the end user's problem but a part of the language or a part of the libraries. And so the first solution that Rust uh, started with was this idea of green threads which have been successful in a lot of languages. And so green threads basically look like blocking I.O. They look like spawning threads and then just blocking on I.O. and everything looks exactly the same as if you were using the native OS primitives. But they've been designed as part of the language runtime to uh, be optimized for this use case of having these network services which are trying to spawning, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, uh, maybe millions of uh, green threads at the same time. Uh, a language I think that right now that is like having a lot of success with this model is Go where they're called Go routines and so it's very normal for a Go program to have tens of thousands of these running at the same time because uh, they're very cheap to spawn unlike OS threads. And so just the advantage of green threads is that the memory overhead when you spawn an OS thread is uh, much higher because you create this huge stack for, for each OS thread. Whereas green threads, the way they normally work is that you'll spawn a thread that starts with a very small stack that can grow over time. And so spawning a bunch of new threads that aren't using a lot of memory yet uh, is you know, much cheaper. And also a problem with using like the operating system primitives is that you depend on the operating system for scheduling which means that you have to switch uh, from your program's memory space into the kernel space and the context switching uh, adds a lot of overhead if you, once you start having you know, tens of thousands of threads that are all being like, uh, switched between really quickly. And so by keeping that uh, scheduling in the same program you avoid these context switches and that really reduces the overhead. And so green threading is a pretty good model that works for a lot of languages, uh, both Go and Java I believe uh, use this model. And Rust had it for a long time, but removed it shortly before 1.0. And the reason that we removed it is that it ultimately was not a zero cost abstraction, specifically because of the, um, the, the first issue that I talked about where uh, it was imposing costs on people who didn't need it. So if you just wanted to write a Rust program that didn't need to use green threads, that wasn't a network service, you still had to have this language runtime that was responsible for scheduling all of your green threads. And so, uh, this was especially a problem for people who were trying to embed Rust inside of like a larger C application. It's one of the uh, ways that we've seen a lot of success in people adopting Rust is that they have some big C program and they want to start using Rust and so they start 
integrating a bit of Rust into their, pro into their program. It's just writing one section of the code in Rust. Um, but the problem is that if you have to s set up this runtime in order to call the Rust, then that, it's too expensive to just have a small part of your program in Rust because you have to set up the runtime before you can call the Rust functions. And so shortly before 1.0, we removed green threads from the language, we removed this language runtime, and we now have you know, a, a runtime that is essentially the same as C. And so that makes it very easy to call between Rust and C, and it's very cheap, which is one of the key things that makes uh, Rust really successful. And having removed green threads, we still needed some sort of solution to async I.O., uh, but we, what we realized was there needed to be a library-based solution. We needed some sort of way of uh, providing uh, a good abstraction for async I.O. that was not a part of the language, was not a part of this runtime that came with every program, but was just this library that you could opt into and use when you needed it. And the most successful library-based solution in general is this concept called futures. Um, it's also called promises in JavaScript. Um, so the idea of a future is that it's this, uh, it represents a value that may not have evaluated yet. And so you can manipulate it before you actually uh, have, before the future is actually resolved. Eventually it will resolve to something, but you can start running things with it before it's actually resolved. And uh, there's been a lot of like, work done on futures in a lot of different languages, and they uh, are a great way for supporting a lot of like, combinators, and especially this async await syntax that makes it much more ergonomic to like, build on top of this concurrency primitive. And so futures, uh, uh, can represent a lot of different things. Uh, so async IO is kind of the, the biggest and most prominent one where you know you maybe make a network request and you immediately get a future back which once the network request is finished will resolve into whatever that network request was returning. Uh, but you can also represent things like timeouts where a timeout is just a future that will resolve once that amount of time has passed. And even things that aren't doing any IO or anything like that where just CPU intensive work uh, you can run that on like a thread pool and then just get a future that you hold on to that once the thread pool is finished doing that work, uh, the future will resolve. The problem with futures was that uh, the way that they've been represented in most languages is this callback based approach where you have this future and you can schedule a callback to run once the future uh, resolves. And so the future is responsible for figuring out when it resolves and then when it resolves it runs whatever your callback was. And all these abstractions are built on top of this model. Uh, and this just really didn't work for Rust because uh, there's a lot of ex people experimented with it a lot and found that uh, it just was forcing way too many allocations. Essentially every callback that you tried to schedule had to get its own separate like trait object heap allocation. And so there were these allocations everywhere, these dynamic dispatches and this like approach failed the zero cost abstraction on the second principle where um, now you were, it was not affecting people who weren't using it but if you did use it, it would just be way slower than if you just had a handwritten something yourself and so why would you use it because if you wrote the thing yourself it would be much faster. But all was, hope was not lost. <coughs> um, sorry, I also have a bit of a cold. Um, this really great uh, alternative abstraction that was pull based um, yes yeah, so we arrived at this model uh, I really want to give credit to um, Alex who's here and um, Aaron Turon who uh, came up with this idea where uh, instead of futures scheduling a callback they're instead you pull them and so there's this other component of the program called an executor which is responsible for actually running the futures and so what the executor does is it pulls the future and the future either returns pending that it's not ready yet or once it is ready it you know returns ready. And this model uh, has a lot of advantages. Uh, one advantage is that you can just cancel futures very simply because all you do to cancel them is you stop pulling them. Whereas with this callback based approach, it was really difficult once you scheduled some work to cancel that work and have it stop. Um, uh, it also uh, really enabled us to have this really clean abstraction boundary between different like, parts of the program. So most sort of futures libraries come with an event loop and that's just the 
your features are scheduled across this event loop with these, this way of doing I.O. and you really don't have any control over it. But in Rust, uh, we have this really clean boundary between the executor which schedules your features, the reactor which handles all of the I.O. and then your actual code. And so the end user can decide uh, which executor they want to use, which reactor they want to use, giving them the kind of control that uh, is really important in a systems language. But the real advantage, the most important thing about this model is that it enabled us to have this really perfect zero cost uh, way of implementing futures where they're each represented as this kind of state machine. And so the way this works is that when the futures that you code that you write gets compiled down to, uh, gets actually compiled into native code, what it is is this kind of like state machine where it has one variant for each uh, pause point for each I.O. event essentially. And each var that variant then has the state that it needs to resume from that I.O. point. And uh, that is represented as this essentially like an enum where it's this one uh, structure where it's the variant, the discriminant and then a union of all of the states that it could possibly need. And so this is an attempt to visually represent that abstractly where this is a uh, this state machine has, you know, you perform two I.O. events and so it has these different states and each state it has this, the amount of like uh, space it needs to store everything you would need to restore to, to that state. And the entire future is just a single heap allocation that's that size where you just allocate that uh, state machine to, into one place in the heap and uh, it's just no additional overhead. So you don't have these like all these boxed callbacks and, and things like that. You just have this like perfect, really truly zero cost model. So I feel like that is usually a bit confusing to people. So I try to, this is the, my best keynote, um, visually represent uh, what's going on, which is that the, so you spawn a future and that puts the future in the heap in this one location and then it, there's a handle to it that you start with the executor. The executor pulls the future until eventually the future needs to perform some sort of I.O. In which case uh, the uh, future gets handed off to the uh, reactor and the reactor which is handling the I.O. registers that the future is waiting on this particular I.O. event and then eventually when that I.O. event happens the reactor will wake up the future using the waker argument that you passed in when you pulled it. And so waking the future up uh, passes it back to the executor uh, and then the executor will pull it again and it will just go back and forth like this until eventually the future resolves. And so then when the future uh, finally resolves and evaluates its final result, the executor knows that it's done and then it drops the handle and drops the future and the whole thing is finished. And so it forms this sort of cycle where you pull the future, wait for I.O., wake it up again, pull it again, on and on in a loop until eventually the whole thing is finished. And this model ended up being uh, quite fast. This is a sort of uh, the benchmark that was posted in the first post about futures where uh, benchmarked futures against um, a lot of different uh, implementations from other languages. Uh, higher is better and futures is the one on the far left. Uh, so we had this really great zero cost abstraction that was, you know, competitive with the fastest uh, kinds of implementations of async I.O. in a lot of other languages. But of course the problem is that you don't want to write these state machines by hand, right? You have your whole entire application state as a state machine is like not very pleasant to write. But that's where the future abstraction is really helpful is that we can build these other APIs on top of it. Um, and so the first solution that we had was this idea of futures combinators where you can build up these state machines but uh, applying all of these methods to the future, sort of similar to the way that iterator adapters like filter and map work. And so this function, um, it just, what it does is it requests rustlang.org and then converts that, the response to a string. And um, so instead of returning just a string, it returns a future of a string because it's going to be an async function. And it has these futures in the body that it's going to be uh, calling and those are going to actually be the parts that do some I.O. And then they're all sort of combined together using these combinators like and then and map. Um, and we build all these combinators like and then map, filter, map error, like all kinds of different things. Uh, and uh, this works. It has, you know, some downsides, especially these like nested callbacks which can be really difficult to read sometimes. Uh, 
And so because, you know, it has these downsides, we also uh, started at it, tried to implement an async await implementation. And so the first version of async await was not part of the language. Instead, it was this library that provided this through like a syntax plugin. And this is doing the same thing that the previous uh, function did. It just fetches rustling and turns it to a string. But it does so uh, using async await, and so it's much more like straight line, uh, looks much more like the way normal blocking I.O. works, where just like in the example that I showed originally, the only real difference is, the anno is these annotations. And so the async annotation, you know, turns this function into a future instead of just returning immediately. And then the await annotations uh, await on these, on the features that you actually construct inside of the function. And await under this poll model uh, desugars to this sort of uh, loop where what you do is you just pull in a loop and every time you get pending back you yield all the way back up to the executor that you're uh, pending and so then it waits until it gets woken up again. And then when finally the future that you're awaiting finishes, it uh, you know, finishes with the value and you break out of the loop with the value and that's what uh, these await expressions evaluate to. Yes. So this seemed like a, a really good solution you know, you have this async await notation uh, which is compiling down to these really awesome zero cost futures. And so we sort of released futures into the wild and got feedback. And uh, that's where we ran into problems. Um, that essentially anyone who tried to use futures uh, quickly ran into very confusing error messages where it would just kind of complain about how your future isn't static or it doesn't implement this trait and it would be sort of this baffling thing you didn't really understand and the compiler would like make helpful suggestions which you would just follow until eventually it compiled. And so you would be like annotating closures with move and you would put things into reference counted pointers and clone things and this and that and it all felt like you were adding all this overhead to the thing that you didn't, didn't seem necessary, you didn't understand why you had to do it and also when you were done your code ended up looking like soup. And so tons of people were bouncing off of futures and it didn't help that the combinators uh, produced these really huge types where your entire terminal would be filled up with like the type of one of your combinator chains. Where it'd just be like, you know, an and then of an and then of a map error of a TCP stream and so on. And, you know, you have to dig through this to try to figure out what the actual error that you encountered was. And I found this quote on Reddit which I think really beautifully sums up uh, all of the complaints about features. Which was that, you know, when using features the error messages are inscrutable. Having to use ref cell or clone everything for each feature leads to overcomplicated code, and it makes me wish that Rust just had garbage collection, which is, yeah, not great feedback. Um, so, looking at the situation maybe a year, year and a half ago, uh, it was clear that there were sort of two problems that needed to be done to make, like, needed to be solved in order to make features uh, more usable for people, and the first was. We needed better error messages and so the easiest way to do that is to build the syntax into the language and then it can hook into all of our diagnostics and error, handle, error message, you know, support so that you can have really good error messages for uh, async await. Uh, but the second was that most of these errors that people were running into were actually uh, them bouncing off a sort of obscure problem which is called the borrowing problem where uh, there was this fundamental limitations in the way the futures was designed that made it so something really common pattern was not possible to express. And that problem was that you can't, in the original design of features, you could not borrow across an await point. So if you were to await something, you couldn't have any references that were alive at that time. And so when people were having these problems that they were bouncing off of, what they were actually, ultimately what they were doing was they were trying to borrow while they were awaiting and they couldn't do that. And so if we could just make it so that was allowed, then most of these errors would go away and the, everything would be much easier to use and you could just kind of write normal Rust code with async and await and it would all work. And um, these kinds of borrows during awaits are extremely common because just the natural API surface of Rust is to have references in the API. And so, <coughs> but the problem with futures is that uh, when you actually compile the future which has to restore, store all that state, when you have some references to something else that's in the same stack frame, what you end up getting is this sort of self-referential future. And so here's the, some code from the original like get user method 
where we have this SQL string, and then when we call query with it, uh, we use pass a reference to the SQL string. And so the problem here is that um, this reference to the SQL string is a reference to something else that's being stored in the same future state. And so it becomes this sort of self-referential struct where you have these are the fields of the future in theory if it were, you know, a real struct. It would have, you know, the database handle that you were, in the self aspect of it, but then it would also have the SQL string and the reference to the SQL string, which is ultimately a reference pointing back to a field of the same struct. And self-referential structs are sort of a really hard problem that we don't have a general solution for. And the reason that we can't allow you to have reference to the same structs is that when you, uh, when you move that struct, then what happens is that we make a new copy of the struct in the location that you're moving it to, and the old copy becomes invalidated. But when you make that copy, the reference that was self-referential is still pointing to the old copy. And that becomes a dangling pointer, and it's the kind of memory issues that Rust has to prevent. So we can't have self-referential structs because if you move them around, then they become invalidated. But what made this like really frustrating in the futures case was that uh, we actually don't really need to move these futures around. So if you remember the, the model where the future is in the heap and a handle to it is getting passed back and forth between the reactor and the executor, uh, the future itself never actually moves. And so it's totally fine for the future to contain self-references as long as you never move it and you don't need to move it. So what we really needed to solve this problem was some way to express in the API of futures that while you're pulling it, you're not allowed to move it around. And then if we just could express that somehow, then we could, uh, we could allow uh, these kinds of self-references in the body of the future, and then we could just have these, really, these references in your async functions and everything would work. And so we were working on this problem, and ultimately uh, we came out with this um, new API called PIN. Uh, and so PIN is a sort of adapter around other pointer types where they become this, a pinned reference instead of just a normal reference. And a pinned reference, in addition to whatever other guarantees it has, it guarantees that the reference will uh, never, the value that the reference is pointing to will never be moved again. And so it guarantees that it's going to stay in the same place until eventually it gets deallocated. And so if you have something in your API which says that it has to come be taken by pin, then you know that it will never be moved again and you can have these kinds of self-referential structs. And so we changed the way that futures work so that now instead of just being a box future, it's a box future behind a pin. So we know that wherever we box it up, put it in the heap, it's guaranteed now by part of the pin API that it will never move again. And then, you know, when you pull the future, instead of just passing a normal reference to it, we pass a pinned reference to it. And so the future knows that it, will, that it can't be moved. And the trick here that makes this all work is that you can only get an unpinned reference out of a pinned reference in unsafe code. It's an unsafe function to be able to do that. And so the API uh, looks roughly like this, where you have pin, which is just you know a, a wrapper around another t uh, around a pointer type. It doesn't have any runtime overhead or anything. It just like demarcates it as being pinned. And then uh, a pinned box can be converted into a pinned reference. But the only way to convert a pinned reference into an unpinned reference is to use an unsafe function. And so uh, what we did was then we just changed the futures API so that we, uh, instead of taking a normal reference, it takes a pinned reference. And uh, otherwise, the API is the same as it was before. And uh, this is essentially the API that we're going to, going to be stabilizing. And so uh, with that change, this code from the first example just works the way that it's written. And so you can just write code exactly the way you would write it with blocking I.O., add these async and await annotations, and then what you get is uh, this, you know, async I.O. with this really awesome zero cost abstraction where uh, it's basically as cheap as if you hand wrote the state machine yourself by hand. So the situation today, uh, pinning was stabilized uh, in the last release about a month ago. Uh, we're in the process of stabilizing the future API, so probably in uh, 135, maybe it will slip and be 136, which is, you know, in about 
two or three months, basically. And then we're hoping sometime this year we'll have async await stabilized, hopefully by the end of summer even, we're gonna have this stabilized and so that people will be able to write uh, non-blocking IO network services using this syntax that makes it very similar to writing with blocking IO. Uh, looking beyond that stabilization, we're also uh, already starting to work on um, these sort of more long-term features like streams I think is probably the, the next big one where uh, it's an async fun feature, like, so a feature is just you know one value but a stream is many values being yielded asynchronous <coughs> being yielded asynchronously, it's essentially like an asynchronous iterator. And so you'll be able to like loop asynchronously over a stream and, and things like that. And it's very important for like a lot of use cases where you have like, you know, streaming, HTTP, uh, web sockets, HTTP to push requests, that kind of thing where instead of having a networking like RPC model where you, you know, make a network request and get a single response, you have streams of responses and requests going back and forth. Uh, there's also today a limitation that async fn can't be used in traits. Uh, there's a lot of work being done in the compiler to make it so that it would be able to support that. And uh, looking out even beyond these features, uh, someday we want to have generators where, uh, sort of similar to generators in like Python or JavaScript, where instead of just having functions that return, you can also have functions that yield. And so then you can resume them again after they yield, and you can use these to write uh, functions as a way of writing iterators and streams similar to how an async function lets you write a function that's actually a future. But I guess just sort of recapping uh, the real critical insights that led to this sort of zero cost async IO model where that first was this pull based version of futures where we were able to compile these features into these really uh, tight state machines. And then secondly that this way of doing async uh, wait syntax where we're able to have references across the wait points because of the pinning. I don't, she's supposed to say thank you. I don't know how it became an X. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah.